Today we are concluding the mini series JRC, ABAI, and A Reckoning. Please consider hitting that subscribe button if you enjoy hearing my perspective or from me in general. Liking, subscribing, and commenting all help YouTube know to show my videos to more people so they learn more about autism and from autistic people. In the last video from this series, we went over the special task force meeting that happened at the ABAI convention, as well as the protest held at JRC. Today, we're going to be looking at the report from the special task force visit to the Judge Rotten Rotenberg Center and the vote that calls this series to its conclusion. After visiting the Judge Rotenberg Center, the ABAI Special Task Force put together a report as well as a recommendation. While we certainly do not have the time to go over the entire document, I would like to go over areas that I found of special interest with you now. First, we got to see the most recent data regarding JRC students that have the Contingent Electric Skin Shock CES device as part of their program. According to the report, as of July, 52 clients aged 26 to 59 years with a median age of 35, out of the total 292 clients 7 to 62 years with a median age of 22, at the JRC had a treatment plan that included the use or potential use of CES. This confirms that no children are currently on the shock device, which is consistent with what I had concluded from the first video in this series, since there had been a ruling banning new students having CES added to their program. They also note in this section that there have not been any peer-reviewed studies on using CES in a behavior analytic journal for 20 years. They spend some time going into papers, peer-reviewed and not, that go into the whole use of CES and claims around it, which we've gone over the gist of already. Then they go into the current procedures at JRC regarding CES use. One licensed psychologist who is also a BCBAD, two other BCBADs, and two other licensed psychologists, one full-time and one part-time, are tasked with supervising the 52 CES cases. In ABA's view, this is both good and bad. They feel that having BCBADs in charge is the most appropriate. From the view of someone who feels like ABA has a nasty habit of brainwashing its practitioners into being okay with some very questionable things, I'm personally not put too much at ease by that. However, I can see why ABAI would prefer that their well-trained professionals would be in charge rather than someone who doesn't know anything about CES, especially when it's being administered as part of ABA. They go on to address the concerns of the strength of the CES and say the following. Because the current passes only through the skin, it does not cause neuromuscular incapacitation, nor does it affect heart or brain function. In these respects, the GED3 and GED4 devices differ greatly from the electrical current applied by a taser, which is designed to incapacitate coordinated muscular activity, electroconvulsive therapy, which is designed to induce a brain seizure, and defibrillators, which are designed to affect heart rhythm. Once again, we had addressed this in the first video. The function is different, but the level of pain and conduction are not. That's the point that everyone has been making. Not that it incapacitates like a taser, but rather that the intensity and pain are worse than one due to the current. Later in the report, they share that the four clients they interviewed said the device was painful, and that three of the task members received a shock from the GED3. Mind you, that's not the more powerful GED4 that most are graduated to because the GED3 isn't strong enough, according to JRC, and could attest that it is indeed painful. Another safeguard mentioned is that of a limit of 10 applications of the CES to a client in a 24-hour period without the approval of the clinician. The clinician usually gives approval if they are in the early stages of treating a new topography or if review of the historical records indicates that they sometimes require more than 10 applications in a 24-hour period to achieve a successful outcome which gives me serious doubts concerning the effectiveness of the safeguard. Something else they mention is the live closed circuit cameras that are always monitored. They say it is for watching for target behavior, how staff intervene, and ensuring that protocol is followed. This is consistent with reports we've heard. The cameras are in part for staff to make sure that every behavior on the plan gets met with a shock. The shocks are first administered by one staff member immediately any time a behavior occurs. It is not until the problem behavior is reduced to an acceptable level that their verification procedure is implemented, where two staff members have to agree that the behavior is one that requires CES administration. While this verification process appears to be a good way to help reduce wrongful applications, it also leads to a delay of up to two minutes, where they get a verbal reprimand immediately and a shock after verification. 
For some, the delay is up to 30 minutes. This results in the seemingly random shock administrations that have been reported. Some plans give a pre-verification approval, where the shock is administered immediately by one person and renewal for this pre-verification happens hourly with another staff member. They report that CES is never administered in cases where there is not monitoring, recording, and or verification in place, which is usually in the residences. Additionally, they say that one clinician reported that for his clients, CES is rarely delivered due to the lack of required monitoring. This sentence is especially interesting to me because of this being one clinician's client specifically and the use of the word rarely, yet protocol would indicate that CES administration should not be occurring at all when unmonitored. Before we continue with the rest of the report, I would like to take a moment to thank today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by me and my new merch shop on Fourth Wall. I'm excited to share this new shop with you because I feel these tees are softer and nicer than the ones I could offer through my previous site. Check out a variety of designs relating to autism, neurodivergence, and occupational therapy. I enjoy creating a variety of designs to meet things that I would like to see, and I hope that these are designs that you all enjoy as well. You can find these to purchase for yourself at stephanie-bethany-shop.fourthwall.com or more simply, you can go check out the description box and I'll have it linked there as well. Thank you so much for your support by purchasing from my store. Now, back to the video. The report then continues on to explain what CES is used to treat, and this is especially interesting because of the lawyer's letter that had claimed that skin shock is not used for saying no. However, one can imagine that saying no is considered to be non-compliance, correct? This is what the ABAI task force notes that the CES is being used to treat. Aggression, self-injurious behavior, other behavior JRC deems as health dangerous, property destruction or attempts to destroy property, disruptive behavior, stealing, non-compliance, and attempts to remove the GED. More enlightening is what comes next. JRC's records note that sometimes more severe behaviors emerge when less dangerous behaviors do not result in a shock. Additionally, court-approved treatment plans indicate that some seemingly minor behaviors are followed by CES because they interfere with educational or social development, e.g. noncompliance, or because they could be harmful under certain situations, e.g. urinating outside of the toilet. This is a great time to note that ABA considers stimming to interfere with educational and social development. Then the report sheds light on something called a holster program that I don't recall hearing about before. It's for those who have habituated to the GED4 or the GED4 is no longer effective for them. I'd like to know how horrific life must have been for someone to habituate to the GED4, especially for autistic people who have impaired habituation. There are currently four clients who have this as part of their plan, which is honestly heartbreaking. I'm just glad they haven't managed to make another stronger GED like they did when the GED3 was habituated to or was no longer effective. Since this holster program is new to me, I imagine it is new to you as well, so we're going to go over the entire paragraph in the report describing it. If a client's behavior habituates to the GED4, or if the GED4 is not effective, a holster program may be introduced to decrease problem behavior. Currently, four clients have this in their plan. The holster program is implemented as follows. Starting with one-minute sessions, gradually increased to 10 minutes, the client receives continuous access to preferred videos, television shows, music, etc. for keeping their hands in the holsters. Contingent on removing their hands, the reinforcement stops and they receive assess. Once they have been successful in 10-minute sessions, they continue to receive these sessions on a regular basis as practice sessions to maintain the effectiveness of holster wearing to decrease problem behavior throughout the remainder of the day. Clients do not need to have their hands in the holsters throughout the day, but they do wear them throughout the day. When the holster is on the client's body, CES is applied after a targeted problem behavior, and the client is then immediately exposed to a 10-minute holster session, contingent reinforcement and avoidant of CES for keeping hands in holster. 
this is a somewhat strange approach to me and the concept of practice sessions is especially worrying considering the things they've done before, like making a person do the target behavior just to receive a set. At random, you must put your hands and keep them in a holster or you're going to get shocked. That just doesn't sit right with me. At least they're getting something desirable considering the reports we've heard where there is an excessive use of loss of privilege, so pretty much anything desirable is often not available. Honestly, any new programs that they come up with after the GED4 is considered to be not effective or habituated to is worthy of concern and scrutiny. At least it appears they're turning back towards rewards rather than punishments. I would say positive or negative reinforcement, but those words have different meanings than you would think in behaviorism. As the ABA practitioners and others at the special task force session had brought up, the lack of ability to fade with the cess has long been an issue at JRC. They note that the fading plans are individualized, which makes sense, but they also mention that it involves reducing the number of devices worn simultaneously, which is a statement that strikes me as odd and concerning. Previously in the document, they have specified electrodes, so I'm wondering what is meant by devices here? Additionally, they state that clients have approved treatment plans for long durations of time, some as many as 15 or 20 years. This has honestly always kind of confused me because they are supposed to get reapproved every year in court, yet we have these very long approvals happening. So what I'm wondering is if a clinician gives like really long multiple year approvals and then the court just looks at the therapist had approved it and then they just approve it based on that every year. I'm not 100% sure on that. They also provided a demographic data chart likely in response to neuroclastics claims, which shows no appearance of overrepresentation of a racial or ethnic group enrolled in CES. Also, as anticipated by many, they reported observing no CES and no problem behavior among those wearing CES during their short tour of the classrooms. Clients reportedly greeted and initiated interactions with JRC's clinical director and chief executive officer, and these interactions were considered to be largely positive and appropriate. Additionally, they didn't see anyone who is wearing the GED cry, display avoidance behavior, or aggression toward the director, CEO, or the other staff. Of course you didn't. Any of those types of actions would have probably been met with a seriously painful shock or who knows what after the fact when everyone was gone. This reminds me of a TikTok that Jen Masumba shared about one of her experiences at JRC, which looks to have since been deleted, but take a look. Every year at Judge Willenberg Center, I would play, when I was there, I would play the piano for graduation for them. And you might say, Jen, why would you play the piano for them? Well, um, it, they didn't force me to, it was a choice, but they did persuade me to by giving me extra special treatment on that day. If I did say yes, they would give me like, shower me with food and positive attention. And so of course I did it every year because I was craving those things. So um, I remember this one particular year, my case manager was sitting with me at the piano and she had given me a bagel with cream cheese. Well, some of the cream cheese had fallen on the panel bench, so I started wiping it off like this. And she started with me, Jennifer, there's no manipulating objects, which was a behavior on my sheet. Like if I played with a pen or an object, that was called manipulating objects, and it was a bad thing that I got in trouble for. So whenever staff would pinpoint me for like manipulating objects or hand play, the worst I would get because I wouldn't know how to keep my hands still because I was getting more and more nervous about keeping my hands still. So I would start like, it would just get worse and worse and worse. So that's what happened then. Like, then I started, I couldn't keep my hands still. I was trying so hard. She would give me a direction to put my hands down and I would, but then they would start moving again and it was just terrible. But she did not pull me from graduation and make me go back to class yet because I hadn't played yet. Graduation hadn't happened. So she just let it continue on. And then once graduation happened and I played the piano, she grabbed me by my arm and pulled me all the way back to my workshop classroom. More on that in another video. She sat me in my seat and she grabbed my device with the shock the buttons on it and she started talking to me. Eh, Jennifer, there's no not following directions. Eh, Jennifer, there's no this. Eh, Jennifer, there's no that. And I was wearing devices on several parts of my body, but she kept shocking me in the same way. Suddenly I felt 
like a searing pain go down my leg and into my foot. And then I just had extreme pins and needles all through my foot. And after that, I had no feeling in my skin on my lower leg or on my foot. Like if I rubbed my hand down my leg, I could see that I was doing it, but I couldn't feel it. And um, I went to the doctor for another reason and I told him about my leg and he, he said, well, what's this thing on her leg to the staff? And he said, well, that's a device. She has to wear that. He said, listen, I don't know what this thing is, but it needs to be taken off of her leg. And I wanted to tell him, I wanted to tell him everything so bad, but the staff would report me when we went back and I would get in trouble and probably not get to see the doctor again like that. So I had to keep it to myself. But now I'm telling you that the devices really hurt me and messed me up. Okay, more later. To the task force's credit, they did interview four clients for 10 minutes without any of the JRC staff present. I hope they did not report to the staff about what some of the clients said for their well-being. The task force also clearly stated that assent is not obtained from clients for the use of CES. I honestly feel that the comments made at the special task force session at the ABAI conference did make a difference. The ending address by Carol Pilgrim at that session showed how off the board of ABAI was about where their practitioners stood on things. And I'm glad that at least the task force itself has appeared to have listened to the concerns voiced there, at least in the way that they are addressing things throughout the report. They said that all of the clients they spoke with had cess on their plans, but only client one was receiving it when they visited. It was that same client one who unsolicited and without prompting asked the task force members to remove them from the JRC because they didn't want cess. The others reportedly only mentioned cess when responding to questions. In the report, they noted that Client 2 said that they would have preferred medication or restraint to CES and that CES did not help. Client 3 stated that they did not like the JRC or CES and didn't think that CES helped. Client 4, who they made sure to mention did not have any intellectual disabilities, believes that CES saved them from making themselves blind, and although they did not like wearing the GED, they felt it was occasionally necessary for them and that it saved their life. I personally am interested in further research into this behavior that the client cannot control and finds such a horrific device to be necessary to keep themselves from being blinded. This makes me wonder again about catatonia and how it can manifest in aggressive behaviors. It also is relevant to mention they shared about being traumatized at a psychiatric hospital 20 years before their placement at JRC, which could be a factor in their feelings regarding the situation. The task force also noted that the application of CES varies substantially from client to client. They then report about their interviews with parents of four clients who were enrolled in CES. I don't think that these are the same four that were interviewed because it is not indicated to be. This is what they had to say. All of these parents described difficulties finding facilities that would care for their children due to the severity of their behavior. They stated that the JRC was their best option at the time they sought residential services. All reported that before coming to the JRC, their children were on multiple psychotropic medications and now they were on none. They described CES as a miracle treatment that saved their children's lives. They said their children liked the JRC and had a good quality of life. They asked that we not remove CES as a treatment option. The parents were quite emotional about the improvements their children had experienced with CES as part of their treatment, reporting that their children finally had personalities, something they never realized their children had. Parents reported that they could now have their children visit their homes most of the time without staff accompanying them and that they enjoyed having their children visit. This reads similarly to Jen's situation where time from institutions to institutions and the labels of autism or severe problem behaviors make them ineligible for most places. Many parents will see a place that's willing to take them as better than them being at home destroying everything including themselves in jail or worse. I do find it concerning that parents didn't think that their children had personalities before now. This may be attributed to psychotropic medications, which is an area worth evaluating. These medications are not across the board awful and horrible, but many of them do have severe side effects. And unfortunately, a habit of professionals is to treat the problems with more medications and 
ignore the concerns about these serious side effects. That being said, some of these students may have needed them in more appropriate mixtures or dosages. JRC seems fairly reckless in their desire to ensure that all students are not on medication. And I'm sure that parents are happy to have their children visit and their children are happy to visit them. I think that a good portion of their emotional testimony comes from this predicament that they've come to know as their reality. Basically, this may be the lesser of two evils from their experience. There is a lack of providers who are willing to take cases like the ones at JRC. But let me remind you that Jen, my beautiful and vibrant friend, was considered one of those cases, worst of the worst. JRC was her only chance, and yet here she is, thriving without the constant fear of behaviorism and someone always watching her looming over her. In their summary and conclusion section of the report, they note that Cess does not appear to be able to be effectively faded or discontinued quickly. They also raise concerns about the safeguard that causes a delay in the delivery of CES from the behavioral perspective, including how CES applications could occur contiguous to appropriate behavior. They also express concerns about the court-mandated process, since the expert external review of treatment plans and data is completed by people who are not behavior analysts. They argue that best practice would be to have a behavior analyst who is an expert in the area review it instead. Once again, to their credit, they note that their 2020 ethics code makes behavior analysts responsible for obtaining assent from their clients when it is appropriate and that JRC is not considering assent when selecting CES, even among those with the capacity to make their preferences known. After a lengthy review of approaches other than CES, as well as talking with other providers, they say in yet another summary and conclusion section that there are many alternatives to CES available for treating severe problem behavior. All of the clinical directors at well-respected treatment facilities we interviewed rely solely on these alternatives to CES and reported successful outcomes. They then go into an ethics section before finishing with their recommendations. They recommended that the use of CES be highly restricted. They outline a long list of requirements they feel must be met before CES should be used. Some of them include things like ensuring that CES only be considered after other competently implemented non-CES programs had failed. A doctoral-level behavior analyst independent of the CES provider agrees. The individual or their guardian has a meaningful, informed choice between CES and other less restrictive treatment options. A medical professional has ruled out conditions that may be related to problem behavior. Efforts must be made to gain individuals' assent, and monitoring should occur throughout treatment to watch for indication of withdrawal of assent. Treatment programs involving CES must be approved and reviewed by a peer review committee and human rights committee and the judgments must be documented, and ensuring that CES is only applied to severe, life-threatening behavior. Thus, the special task force technically recommended CES use only in extreme cases. The council reviewed the report as well as the comments submitted and apparently could not come to a single conclusion. This resulted in the drafting of two position statements to be put up for vote. Something people may have found frustrating and restrictive was that only full members of ABAI were allowed to vote on the issue. From my understanding, this has always been how things were supposed to go according to ABAI's bylaws. According to their website, full members must have a minimum of a master's degree in psychology, behavior analysis, or a related discipline and demonstration of competence in either the experimental or the applied analysis of behavior. Applicants are reviewed by an application review committee who must approve them. Although the full member requirement significantly narrowed down the amount of people eligible to vote on the matter, 65% of those who voted had done so in approval of position B, which became the official position of ABAI. Their official position statement reads as follows. The Association for Behavior Analysis International, ABAI, and its members respect the personal dignity and worth of every human being and affirm each individual's right to effective behavioral treatment and to freedom from inappropriate, unnecessary, and or intrusive interventions. Behavior analytic principles constitute the foundation of the professional practice of applied behavior analysis and are essential to ethically sound and effective treatment programs. In accordance with these values, we strongly oppose the use of contingent electric skin shock, CES, under any condition. Congratulations to everyone who fought so hard to make 
ABAI hear them on this issue. The ABA community had a reckoning with ABAI and JRC, and the official tie between these two entities has been severed with this statement. I feel this is a huge blow to JRC. Another came in the form of a few small lines in the giant 2023 Consolidated Appropriations Act, which was primarily a bill budgeting federal areas. This is an important bill for anyone in healthcare, but surprisingly, it is an important bill for anyone watching the situation with JRC and CES. Section 3306, Bans of Devices for One or More Intended Uses, amends Section 516A of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act by inserting for one or more intended uses and or to make such intended use or uses a banned intended use or uses. A device that is banned for one or more intended uses is not a legally marketed device under Section 1006 when intended for such use or uses. Essentially, they fixed the problem that got the ban on the GED overturned in the first place, that being that they did not have the authority to ban a medical device for a specific use. This language that was part of the new bill that has been passed now makes it so that the FDA can now indeed do that. I'm not sure what particular route the FDA plans on going to make this happen, but I am sure this is a move to get the GED banned. With the FDA having the power to ban a device for a specific use and ABAI, as well as a good portion of the ABA community condemning the use of CES, I am optimistic that the use of CES will cease in the near future. This concludes our mini series. If you enjoyed this video, found it informative or whatever else, go ahead and hit that like button and let me know all of your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoy hearing from me about autism related topics, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Thank you to everyone who supports me here on YouTube as YouTube channel members through Ko-fi and as patrons on Patreon. And a special thank you to my Spinny Stimmy tier patrons, Philip Noah, Jack Varney, and Snowbird. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye!